Okay, I'm gonna begin. Thank you everybody for coming. A little bit about myself before we begin. Um, my name is Vittorio, I work at Bloomberg. Currently I'm doing training and I've been working with C++ for over 10 years. I started thanks to game development. If you wanna know more about that story, you can find me later. And as I mentioned, right now I'm at Bloomberg. I've been working there for over six years. I started working on high performance microservice infrastructure and trading infrastructure, like trading data infrastructure. But since three years, I've been focusing on teaching more C++ inside the company, teaching more advanced topics, and getting people up to speed with the newer standards of the language. I co-authored this book recently with John Lakos, Rostislav Klebnikov, and Alice Armadiv, and many other contributors, specifically for the ISO committee as well. It's available outside if you want to discuss about the book. I'm also available later. I participate in standardization. I'm part of the Italian national body. And I have a lot of side projects. I love C++ as a hobby, not just as a full-time job. So I've been doing open source work, game development, created some tools and libraries. I have a lightning talk on uh, one of those tonight. And I write video tutorials and write articles uh, about weird C++ stuff. Anyway, what are we going to do during this talk? In general, I like, about, uh, um, I like the topic about complexity a lot, as it's something that I care. Um, because in my open source work, for example, when I started migrating the popular SFML library from C++ 03 to 17, we had a lot of discussion regarding how can we use C++ effectively and in a simple manner. During my employment, when I'm teaching, I also try to you know, be as simple as possible when I teach new features to people and try to give the right advice in the way they must use them. In the book as well, simplicity is another topic that I cover a lot. And as a personal interest, I believe that coding is not just a tool, but it can be an art. Your code can be elegant, it can be simple, and we, sh we should strive to do that. Complexity in general can appear both as a high level and at a low level. By high level, I mean something like system design, software architecture, using design patterns. And by low level, probably things that are more you know, coding specific, C++ specific, you know, how do you design an abstraction? What is your coding style? What kind of language features should you use in a certain area, and so on. This talk will mainly focus on low-level complexity, so more C++ specific things, but some of the guidelines and ideas that we're gonna discuss also apply to the high-level sort of complexity discussion. What are the goals? Well, we'll try, we're gonna try to derive some pragmatic and actual guidelines from some various examples, two of them. And basically, and we're gonna do this through some code snippets. I'm gonna ask you what you think, and we're gonna figure out these guidelines together. And the idea is once you have these guidelines, whenever you face some sort of conf conflict or doubt, you can use these guidelines to basically make your life a bit easier and resolve that problem. And in general, even if we end up disagreeing, one of the goals is sparking some interesting discussion, getting you to think about these problems, and you know, potentially make your code a bit simpler in, in the future. Let's keep this interactive. I'm gonna ask you questions. I'm gonna expect you to reply. So if you wanna interact, probably best to move towards the front. And that's it, so let's begin. Let's try this. I'm gonna show you some snippets and I'm gonna ask you which one of them do you find simpler. I haven't defined simplicity yet, but just, let's just use your intuition. And if you think the one on the left is simpler, just raise your hand with a closed fist. If you think the one on the right is simpler, just raise your hand with an open palm. So what do you think? Okay, so pretty much everybody raised open palm. Does anybody think that the one on the left is simpler? Anybody? Why? I'm curious. Is that again? Explicit type, that's interesting. Yeah, so the one on the left is a C style array. You have an explicit type. The one on the right you're using CTAD. But yeah, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep this in mind. What about this one? Same thing as before. Okay, what about this one? Okay, I'm curious, people that think that the left one is simpler, can anybody give me a reason? Sure. Okay, so the comment is that the one on the left more explicitly expresses your intent that you're iterating over a range and you don't have all those moving parts for the iterator. Yes? I think I was going to mirror that. I don't need to know that you're incrementing the iterator. Say that again? You need to know that you're incrementing i. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. So another comment is you don't really need to know that you're incrementing i. That's an implementation detail. 
I'm not going to tell you what I think so far, but let's just keep going. So defining simplicity and complexity is something that's not really easy. Um, we do have an intuition for it. You know, we can kind of like sense what's simple and what's not simple, but we also have to be careful because we have biases. And an, an example of that is familiarity. If you're familiar with a certain coding style or familiar with a certain feature, you are going to end up thinking that the use of the feature is simpler than the others, maybe just because of the familiarity. So that's something to be careful about. Generally speaking, I think we all agree that we deem code simple if it's easy to understand, maintain, change, test, debug, if it can protect us from mistakes at compile time, and it has a limited amount of moving parts. More moving parts we have, there's more chance for complexity. There is subjectiveness with all these criteria, and in general, you know, you always have to optimize for a certain goal. I'm assuming here we want to optimize for readability and maintainability of your code, but if you want to optimize for, you know, fast prototyping and a lot of changes, then the goals might change. So let's try to compromise. Let's agree on what simplicity means by comparing this example. We're going to have more of them, and hopefully the room kind of like agrees toward the same direction. We're going to derive some precepts from these examples, and then we're going to discuss where these ideas, where these guidelines might fall short in the real world. So let's start deriving the first precept. Let's imagine you have this function. It's called fill texture rect. It takes a color, some coordinates, and size. And you don't have any way of changing this. Maybe it's an external API. And now you have two choices. How do you call this function, maybe given that your, um, that your coordinates are not in the right type? OK. Anybody that likes the C style cast more? OK, why? I'm curious. OK, so the comment is that the C style, in this case, does the same thing as a static cast. And it's probably shorter, right? OK. So now I'm going to start telling you a little bit about what I think. I'm not necessarily trying to convince you, but maybe we can agree on uh, how I reason, and maybe that can help you as well. So C style and functional casts are syntactically very concise. That's obviously an advantage that we can all see. And static casts and all the other C++ casts are more verbose. That's an objective, um, an objective property of them. I don't want to say benefit or drawback. However, I think that a study cast, rather, objectively, a study cast is mechanically simpler than a C style cast. And by mechanically simpler, I mean this. If you look at how a C style cast is defined, you will see that there are a lot of steps that it can do. So in that case that we showed before, in the slide that we showed before, sure, it will be equivalent. But the feature itself can end up doing things from a const cast or interpret cast followed by a const cast. And in general, you know, it's way more complicated in the way that it is defined than it can work. One of the things that you may notice is that static cast appears in the definition of a C style cast. It's defined in terms of that. So why do I think that, in general, static cast is simpler than a C style cast? And that was pr pretty much the opinion of most of the room. Well, as I mentioned, since it's defined in terms of a static, static cast, for me, that's proof that you know, the C style cast does more than it. Uh, C style cast is more powerful. We can end up doing interpret cast. There's more implicit behavior. When you see it, it depends on the context, what's going to happen. And it's generally a little bit more error prone if you don't know what you're doing. This is a screenshot from a pattern matching paper um, from Herb Sutter, I think. And this is a part that proposes this as operator. I don't know if Herb is in the room. I don't want to pick on you. But um, I don't like this. And the reason why I don't like this is that you have a single keyword that basically can do a lot of different things. As you can see here, it can either result in a dynamic cast or in a normal cast. You can actually overload it and so on. So the idea behind it is quite nice. You know, you want to have a single way of performing a conversion that works in every possible aspect and way. However, to me, this is not simple because you need to know that, that this single thing has a lot of potential implicit behavior and can result in many other uh, operations under the hood. So there's a trade-off there between uh, conciseness, flexibility, and simplicity. Another one. What do you think about this one? Absolutely, yes. So, one thing that the C style cast does not have, that the static cast does have, is brackets. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, 
I'm going to try to rephrase your comment. So one thing that the C-style CAS doesn't have is that it doesn't use angle brackets to specify the type. And we as Salesforce pro programmers, we are more familiar with that syntax because we use it in templates. So seeing it in a static cast also makes it more familiar to us. Is that your point? Yeah. Any more comments? OK. So what about this one? What do you think? OK, interesting. I'm going to see like 50-50 uh, now, a lot of different opinions. So people that like the one on the left with them place back, why do you think that it is more simple? Anybody? I saw. Okay, so basically your, 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 your um, comment is you can use it everywhere and it just works. That's why it's most, more simple. More often. More often, okay. You can use and place back more often even when it's not strictly needed. What about the people that like the pushback? Why do you like the pushback more in this situation? It's all you need. Yeah, I like that. Concise comment. You don't need in place back so we can get away with pushback. What about this one? Okay. Fine. Again, I see a nice 50-50 distribution, sort of. So I'm, I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to basically try to figure out what's in common with all these things. We've seen casting and placing, locking. They are very different operations, but I think we have an under underlying theme in common that can help us understand why we deem some of them simpler or more complicated. So if I ask you, um, you know, please hang a painting to the wall using a nail, what would you use? Would you use a hammer, which, by the way, is generated by Dolly, all these images. This, is, this hammer doesn't exist. Or a jackhammer that doesn't exist either. Anybody? Does anybody would use the jackhammer? That'd be funny, but I don't think it would be a good idea, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is um, that a C-style cast is more powerful than a static cast, and place back is more powerful than pushback, and scope lock is more powerful than the lock guard. If you're not familiar with scope lock, I'm going to show you how it works in a second. And with great power comes great responsibility. You know about this. I couldn't take a frame from the movie, so I found this. this is the next best image that I found, and it works. <laughs> so here's another example with scope lock. Many people liked it, and I'm going to ask those same people, but also everybody in the room, do you think that this code is OK? If you think it's OK, you can raise your hand. Say that again? What does OK mean again? Would you let it go through code review? No? Why not? Say that again? OK, so it does compile. However, nothing is protected. We don't have a mutex. We are just creating a scope lock that doesn't protect anything. And you might be surprised, why does this compile? And this is a consequence of scope lock being more powerful, more generic than a lock guard. Scope lock, if you haven't seen, if you haven't seen it before, it was introduced in 17. And what it allows you to do is basically uh, lock multiple mutexes at the same time during construction. It's meant to avoid issues with the ordering of mutexes and things like that. It has a variadic constructor, which also implies you can construct it with zero mutexes, and that's going to be allowed. And in fact, the specification actually tells you that if you have no mutexes, it does nothing. It might actually make sense in a context where you might have a template that creates it, and in some cases it needs to be synchronized or not. So this is not a general statement, but sometimes when you're using a more powerful tool, you also have more rough edges, more things that you need to care about, and more things that can go wrong, like in this case. And it's a consequence of the extra flexibility and generosity of that tool. And this is a slide regarding and place back and push back. So this came to me, I think it was a talk from Kate Gregory that kind of blew my mind when she suggested, hey, you should not always use and place back. Yes, it always works, but you should actually carefully think about where you use and place back and push back because you can, you can communicate intent better. So as we can see from this slide, and placeback can do exactly what pushback can. And in some cases, it's more efficient. So as an example here, when I'm, I'm placing back a string literal into the vector, I'm only having a single constructor core for string from the string literal itself. If I'm using pushback for the same thing, you will see that first I will construct a string on the outside from the literal, and then I will move the string inside the vector. So in this case, and placeback is actually beneficial over the use of pushback. I'm talking about the first two examples. 
Um, in the second case, if I already have a std string somewhere in my scope, in this case I have a local variable called my name, regardless of whether I emplace it back or push it back, it is still gonna do a single copy constructor call. Like there is no benefit in using emplace back here. So the question that people ask is, what's the arm in using emplace back all the time? There really isn't any, you know, danger or real actual problem with this. However, as I mentioned, it's about communicating intent. It's about communicating people that we thought about it and we're using the right tool for the job. And if we choose to use emplace back, we did that for a reason, because it was more beneficial compared to pushback. So this is what I like to think. If I use emplace back, I'm basically making a conscious decision to use it over pushback because it provides a benefit. And if I'm using pushback, I'm doing the opposite. I'm making a conscious decision to use it because there is no benefit in using emplace back in this situation. Yes? To not have to do what, sorry? So the comment is, isn't it a benefit on its own to not have to basically read two different functions or use two different functions when I'm reading the code? Uh, we could argue about that. I, I feel like if these two functions do, di to do two different things, then it makes sense to have two separate operations to describe them, right? And in this case, there is some overlap between the two, but in placeback is strictly more powerful than pushback. So if we wanna keep going through the route of use the, you know, the simplest tool possible, then I think it makes sense to have two functions. But we can discuss that later. I feel like it's a bit more philosophical discussion. And the benefit of this, in my opinion, is, then, is that when people read your code, they will know that you thought about it. If you're the kind of person that uses and plays back everywhere, then it's not really clear whether there is a benefit or not. If you're the kind of person that uses it only when it's beneficial, people reading your code will know that when they see and plays back, there was a reason why you did that, and pushback just was suboptimal. I went to the talk uh, by uh, Dave Abrams yesterday. It was about value semantics, and he, he had this quote, which I really, really liked, and I had to put it in my talk as well. And it's a quote from Nathan Gitter, and he says, local reasoning is the idea that the reader can make sense of the code directly in front of them without going on a journey discovering how the code works. So I really, really liked it. And I think it also fits here, right? If you see pushback, you have more local context. You know that my name would have to be something which has the same type as the vector's element or is convertible to it. If you see emplace back, then whatever you give to emplace back can be the same element, can be convertible, but it could also be any of the function, any, any, any type that is accepted by the constructor of the element type. So your local reasoning becomes a little bit harder if you see emplace back compared to pushback. Yes? Yeah, so Pablo makes a good point. You have, during code review, the reviewer has to do a little bit more effort in this case because they need to check whether the usage of pushback or emplace back was correct. That is an interesting point. I guess it, you know, you're putting more effort during the review part of things, but after the code has been reviewed and merged in, when you read the code, you are sure that there was a little bit of thought put into that. So I'm not saying that this is always the right choice, depends on context, depends on the kind of project you're working on, the team you're working with, but generally speaking, I really value being able to, uh, you know, from, from seeing from the local context what's been going on and rely on the fact that somebody has been using the tool that's right for the job. A few more good examples. std array versus a sysdal array. You know, sysdal arrays are kind of more powerful because they decay to pointers, they do more than std array. Stud variant versus uh, virtual polymorphism. This, of course, will require its own discussion, but in a situation where you could use both to model the same issue, for example, you have a closed set of types, you could both use variant and polymorphism. However, virtual polymorphism is strictly stronger in that case because it also supports an open set of types. If you don't need that, then variant makes more sense. If you just have a choice between A, B, and C, and you don't have an interface that you want other people to extend. Stud byte versus char. So, Characters are basically 8-bit integers. They support all the operations that any other integer support. You know, addition, multiplication, division. These things do not make sense when you try to represent a byte itself. So byte is less powerful and might be the best tool for the job. 
If you were at my lightning talk on, um, on Tuesday, you've also seen that there are drawbacks in using this sort of abstractions. For example, stdbyte, when, compi when compiled in debug mode without optimizations, has more overhead compared to char. So there's a bit also trade-off there, which is a bit more practical. Enum class versus enum, we know that C-style enumerations allow implicit conversions. They are more powerful in that sense. And then this one is also interesting. Um, I remember there was a blog post floating uh, maybe a few years ago that recommended people use autoref everywhere. It's always correct. However, again, for me, it's the same argument um, with and place back versus, special, with, versus pushback. You could use autoref everywhere, for example, in any range-based for loop that you, that you declare. However, if you consciously only use it when you need it, then you're giving people the, the information that you need a forwarding reference there. You know, it's about communicating intent. Forwarding references are way more flexible than a const auto ref, so only use those when you actually need them. So, I think we have enough, enough examples and enough data. What do you think the first precept or guideline is? How would, say that again? Prefer simpler mechanisms, sort of, with a, use the less powerful mechanism, okay. So we could say something like, use the right tool for the job. I don't like this because right is subjective, what is right. So as you mentioned, we can say, use the most limited tool for the job. That's what I would advise people to do. And by most limited, I basically means the tool that has the least power, but still allows you to get uh, the results that you want without any drawback or without any suboptimal result. And now, of course, I have to show you the bad examples where this doesn't really hold that well. So one example that I thought about, one example that I thought about is, um, let's consider the associative containers that we have when you, when you need to have some, something like a map or a dictionary. You could use std map, but you know that std map has ordering. So if you don't need the ordering, you could use an order map. But an order map, just like map, also offers pointer stability. It's a node-based allocation container per each element. So why not using something like abseil hash map, which doesn't have ordering and doesn't have pointer stability? It is strictly less powerful in the sense that it gives you less flexibility, but it's more performant and, you know, you have an extra, you have a one less property that it gives you. But do you really need the extra performance? Is it worth it to include an extra dependency? So while you could use this guideline, this precept, over and over again, it's, you have to be pragmatic about it and sometimes just stop. Aggregate types versus non-aggregates. This is actually very interesting. So aggregate types are simple, for lack of a better words. You know, it's just like a struct with a bunch of fields. You can initialize them without having to write constructors. It's all public. You know, they're very convenient to work with. However, they have issues, right? For example, if I have this person data struct and it has a name, surname, age, and height, and then I initialize the first three fields and I mistakenly forget to initialize the fourth one, then it will be value initialized for me. So basically, this has also has a drawback. But now, would it be reasonable to suggest to everybody that even a simple data struct, which is conceptually just a bunch of fields, should have a constructor? Imagine all the boilerplate code you would have to write to make that work. So again, I am not too sure there are some cases where you have to be pragmatic, so this is why I feel like I'm giving you guidelines but not rules, and I'm gonna talk about that later. But generally speaking, using this rule helped me a lot um, while, while trying to simplify my code. Few more. Actually, one more. Uniform initialization. This one is actually very interesting. I don't like the feature that matches itself, and you know that uniform initialization is more powerful than usual initialization because it can invoke initialize these constructors. Well, you cannot do that if you use parentheses. You have to explicitly opt in into them by creating an initializer list. You can use list initialization to have aggregate initialization, which again, makes it more powerful than the round parentheses. However, in 20, even round parentheses can, use, can, can perform aggregate initialization. So that changed in 20. However, there's also something that's a little bit more powerful about normal initialization compared to list initialization. If you use round parentheses or the equal sign, for example, you can have implicit narrowing conversions. It's an extra thing you can do. And list initialization prevents that. It prevents you from having those narrowing conversions. So which default should be used? There's some pros and cons here in terms of power, so I'm not too sure which one uh, to suggest. So yeah, I would say this is how I would tell people about this precept. Use the most limited tool for the job. 
within reason. There's always caveats, there's always pros and cons, and you have to be pragmatic about it. But if you don't know, this is a good place to start. Let's put it this way. Any questions on this first guideline? OK. So a note on abstraction in general. Um, I feel like this guideline, this precept, holds very well also at a higher level of abstraction. For example, the most basic thing I can think of is don't use a class when a function suffices, right? Why would you reach for that? Um, other example, if you can get your job done with a T on the stack, there's no need for a unique pointer. Or if you can get your job done with a unique pointer, there's no need for a shared pointer. Again, this is again using the most limited tool for the job. And even something like multi-threading, should you, do you need multi-threading or could you get your job done with reasonable performance using a single threading application? So this applies also at a higher level. Another thing that's interesting about abstraction is that an abstraction which is complex to implement, so where you have some complexity inside the implementation, can lead to more simplicity in the code where it's being used when the abstraction you know, is, is a proper one. And an example of this is what I showed you before, this iRange thing. And I was very pleasantly uh, surprised to see many people preferring iRange to the other one, because that's also my choice. iRange might be sort of complicated to implement. You might have to have the custom iterator type. You might need, you know, some sort of, um, you know, figuring out what the common type between the beginning and the end is and so on. However, in the usage, it makes your life much easier. You don't have to care about i anymore. i can be const you know it will go from 0 to 99. You don't have to increment it yourself. You don't have to compare it. And if you think about the C style for loop, it is simple because it's familiar, but, but it has a lot of moving parts. You have this comparison, and you need to make sure the type of the comparison is correct. You have this increment, and the i is not const. It could be mutated as part of the body of the for loop. There's a lot of extra things you have to worry about when you use that one. So yeah, I feel like that i range is less powerful than the traditional loop, and for me, that is an advantage of I ranges, of I range. There's always trade-offs. For example, I range might be slower to compile. Somebody that is not familiar with I range might look at the implementation and be scared about it. So you need to be able to teach it properly and to measure the impact on compilation speed if you have a very large code base or things like that. Yes. Yeah, so the comment is, if I read I range, I'm not sure whether it includes uh, 100 or it stops before 100, right? That can be, it's a good concern, and I appreciate the comment, that can be mitigated with better naming or a better interface. I can imagine something like a builder pattern where you say zero dot uh, until inclusive or until exclusive or something like that. So you can always make it better. You would increase the complexity of the implementation, but potentially make the user site even more explicit. OK, let's go to the second one. Let's see what we can do there. Same goal as before. Let's see who thinks that the first one or second one is simpler. OK, so most people like the second one more. Slight variation on this one. Did anybody that liked the first one before change their mind when they saw this? Okay, a few people. And what about this one? What do you like now? Okay, so I see a lot of people that change opinion quite, quite frequently, but I think that if you have the mental model that I'm thinking of, it makes sense to switch between one or the other. Say that again? Um, so the comment is, when you see that, you, uh, when I see that, I don't think it's the same anymore. Uh, what I think is that discarding the first two is perfectly OK. I'm not too sure about that. I don't know why you would call x on a bidimensional vector and discard it. So the argument we'll, we'll make later is whether the not discard there is actually required for you to understand how it works or whether it's just noise. But keep that in mind. I think it's an interesting comment. What about this one? Hmm. 
Okay, I see a lot of people prefer the one with the autos. Slight variation again, how about now? Okay, I see some people changing their mind. And last one, what do you think about this one? Okay, so somebody who likes this, the one on the left more, why? Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe not. What do you think is incorrect? So the comment is, is the one on the right correct? If square root has a you know, negative or zero argument, would it not throw? I think that depends. I think you can set the behavioral square root with some uh, state flags for math handling. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you can set it to throw exceptions, but by default it just sets Erno, something like that. Does anybody know better? So potentially it could be wrong. So that's a good point and probably something that I also did intentionally on this slide. Okay. So what's in common here? Auto, no accept, attributes. And again, I'm gonna to try to use an analogy which I had trouble finding one, so bear with me for this one. Imagine you are tasked with improving the safety of the roads in your city. How would you do it? You could put you know, a single nice speed limit signal or you can put a million of them on the same road. And as you can see, AI is not really good at having multiple speed signals, but it's totally fine with one, I don't know why. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, repetition of something might just become noise. If I see a lot of speed signals on the same road, they are not as valuable as seeing one that tells you, you know, you have to keep this limit. So using some features zealously uh, can be technically correct. So yeah, you can use notice card on any function that, you know, you should always take it, you should always look at the return value. Um, you could use auto everywhere, as long as you're careful with conversion and stuff like that, it should be fine. You could technically use no accept every time you have a function that doesn't throw, final, or any, cl on any class that you don't expect to, um, to use as a, as a base class, const expert on anything that, you know, uh, is, is um, you know, doesn't use anything that is not invalidating const expert bodies and things like that. However, my, my point here, or rather my opinion, is that sparingly using a feature can increase its value and reduce noise. And, and why is that? If you think about the vector example, so this is just a bidimensional vector that has an X and a Y, then in my opinion, if I use notice card everywhere, it kind of becomes noise. It's on every single function. And sure, it's technically correct, but when I'm reading the code, it doesn't really focus my attention anywhere. If I instead use notice card only on the function that can have ambiguous naming where I could make a mistake, I am drawing attention to that and I'm forcing people to think about it. I'll get you in a second. So in this case here, I consciously chose to not put notice card on X and Y because the likelihood of somebody calling X and Y, which is obviously a getter on a bidimensional vector and not using the result is quite low. And even if they do that, probably the program will be broken anyway because they're not using the coordinate of the vector. However, this function called normalize is very misleading. You might think that it normalizes the vector in place However, it actually returns a new one. The const is a good hint, but it's not enough. If you, if you put notice card there, you are really drawing attention to it. You're saying, okay, the name is not perfect. Maybe it was a name that was decided 10 years ago and we cannot change it anymore. But by putting notice card there, um, you have to be careful about this. I'm gonna take questions, yes. What do you think about uh, using static analysis as a third alternative actually? Uh, discard this, no discard at all and rely on some external tool. So basically relying on some external tool that tells you what should be not discard. Properly one use that, for example, you uh, run this normalize in some wrong context. I'm not sure I get your question. Would you, how would you use the tool? I, I mean that no discard probably means here, uh, or hints here that normalize returns something new rather than normalize this vector. 
Yes. So one may by mistake try to use normalize to normalize this vector and kind of just don't uh, uh, skip that well he uses uh, by mistake. But static analysis uh, tool, kind of external, out from even compiler, can say you, you do something wrong. Yeah, I think that the static analysis tool that you're talking about in this case is actually the no discard attribute, right? If you use this function and you discard a result, the compiler is forced to warn you. That's the definition of no discard. Yes. So if you talk about using, you know, using features zealously and say, saying you want to use them sparingly, how do you feel about const? That's a good point. I have a slide on that later. Um, the point is there it's a bit more nuanced. For example, you know, any int that you take as a function parameter could theoretically be const, right? You could have a function that just takes an int, multiplies it by two, and returns the result, then you should make it const. But is that really useful when the function is just one line long or two line long, right? I feel that requires a bit of thought and depends on the context. I, mean, I was thinking more of decorating member functions. Oh, member, that kind of const, okay. Um, I feel you, like this why, is... Why okay. do you feel the need to decorate x with const but not no except? Okay, so that's an interesting question. I feel like no discard and const are really different in this case. No discard is more like a hint. Like it doesn't change the behavior, right? If you put no discard or if you don't have it, the behavior of the code is the same. Const here, the const qualifier that you put on the member function is required for the correctness of the code. You want to be able to call these functions from a const instance of vec2. So it's not something that's a hint or that you should be using sparingly. It's required for the correctness of the code. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I see it. Um, yes, please. Uh, I think there's a big difference between, the, you know, two, there are two different types of qualifiers here that are mixed together. Mm -hmm. No except and const expert, you're giving me an additional promise about something you have done. Whereas no discard and final, you're basically annoying me and you better have a very good reason because you're not giving me any additional promises. You're preventing me from doing something and the, like, why? What's in it to you? Okay. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, the, the comment is basically that final and no discard can be an annoyance, while constexpr is a bit different in that sense. Constexpr can be an annoyance to your future self. That's how I see it. If you make everything constexpr just because you can, there might be situations where you want to change how a function works, change the API, or even just move the body to a CPP to improve compilation times, and you cannot because you made it constexpr just for the sake of it. That's the annoyance I see to your future self. Yes. A lot of this feels like you're avoiding putting things on there because the language by default doesn't uh, use the, the const expression or the no accept or final, right? Or no discard for that matter. Um, it seems like instead of being more verbose to accurately express intent, you are preferring uh, uh, smaller code, right, uh, for easier readability. Yeah. So an alternative to that might be, I don't know, defining some high-level macro that makes all these things default and then uh, explicitly uh, saying this thing can be discarded or explicitly saying this is a non-const function or a uh, function that throws exceptions, right? Um, how do you feel about that? Yeah, so this is a great observation. If we had the right defaults in C++, then this talk probably wouldn't even exist, right? The reason why I care about this is, sure, you can put no discard everywhere, but there's this common joke that you end up having functions that are like static, const expert in line, no discard, const no accept. Like all of these things are noise. If these were the defaults and they were applied correctly by default from the compiler, then there would be no issue to talk about. The problem here is that as programmers, we have to read the code, we have to maintain it. So, what is the choice that we make? How do we decide whether the added verbosity and noise is worth it? And the point I'm trying to make it is, yes, while you might be correct in using this all over the place, there is a readability cost to it. There is a noise cost to it. So the best cost-benefit cost benefit ratio is when you use these things only in the places where they really matter. That's what I'm trying to say. Regarding the second part of your question, rather than using a macro, I would like to fix this in the language. I had a proposal that I presented in Prague. It's called Epochs. You can Google it. And the idea was like on a per module basis, you could change the defaults of C++. That was rejected. It's still resurrectable. It wasn't a hard rejection. But I feel like even without that proposal, when modules are becoming widespread, there are going to be people that 
you know, have their own custom language that exports, you know, that kind of like compiles to something which is compatible with C++ modules, and we're going to see those sort of changes happening in the wild. So yeah, these, these guidelines, these precepts are, exist because of the way that C++ is today. If it was different, if we have better defaults, they might not be required in the first place. Okay, yeah, that, that seems like a better solution, both in terms of like expre explicitly expressing intent as well as giving both uh, your uh, IDE as well as the compiler more information for uh, optimization and um, for uh, de debuggability. Yeah. Right. Just a note on that, there are, these things are, I put them together, but they are, all of them are a little bit different. For example, constexper changes your API. It's not really the same as on this card. Final, as we were mentioning, prevents you from doing something else. So while a macro might be a reasonable idea at first, remember that, for example, putting no accept everywhere can actually have negative impact, even on performance. And I have some examples of that uh, that I can show you. So it might not always be the best choice. Okay. Uh, Makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So I think on this slide, you're saying that no accept it just adds a bunch of noise to the X and Y getter functions. You had said that they're just plain getter functions. But to me, when I read this code, these are just declarations. I don't see the definition of X and Y. So maybe VEC2 would throw an exception if X or Y are invalid. And so to me, no except actually does provide a lot of value here, or in this case, not a lot of value because it's not there. I see. I, I see your point. Um, in this particular case, I feel like most people would assume that VEC2 doesn't throw an exception on X and Y. They don't need an explicit annotation for that. And the reason is that this is sort of like a ubiquitous type ubiquitous type, everybody has seen a 2D vector, a 3D vector, there would be no real reason for it to throw an exception in those cases. Would the annotation make that clear? Potentially, but again, the counter argument is it could still throw in the body, it's just part of the declaration, right? It's not preventing the body from throwing at all, it's just telling you the same thing. Um, conceptually speaking, I feel like I'd rather use no accepts in those places where it really matters, and maybe this second example is gonna be a little bit more helpful in understanding what my point of view is. But for places where I can reasonably assume that there is really no reason to throw an exception, I would rather not litter the code with that extra noise. But I see your point of view and we can discuss that later. There's trade-offs there as well. Yeah, one more question and then I'll keep going. For this first one here, would a better transformation than adding no discard just be making this a free function? Yeah, so um, that's absolutely a good observation. I'm thinking of this in the situation where, for example, you had this code for 10 years and you're now migrating to 17. You cannot really change the API anymore because people have been using it already. You just trying to make it better, which is sort of the situation that we had with uh, SFML while migrating it from 03 to 17. The real problem here, of course, is not much the, the, the not this card, it's just the name. It's, it's horrible, right? It suggests mutation, but it actually uh, return something. It's the same problem that we had in the standard library with dot empty, right? If it was called dot is empty, then maybe we wouldn't even need the notice card. So the naming matters in these situations. Now, I just want to get to the second example real quick, and this is about no except. Maybe the default constructor of node doesn't need to throw any exception and will never throw any exception. But putting no except there, would it actually give me any benefit? Would people rely on that? Would the libraries rely on that? Instead, I'd rather put no except in places where it provably gives me a benefit. And if I imagine node being one of those types that gets used in containers such as vector, having no except on the move constructor actually makes a huge difference because the vector actually checks that at compile time and decides whether to copy or move depending on that. So in this case for me, choosing where to put no except is important and I wanna put it only on the places where I can prove there is a benefit. There are cases where you have a small function it does some mathematical operation and it just floats, right? It will never throw. You can put no except there, it will be technically correct, but does it actually give you any benefit? Have you measured that your code is actually faster? Is there any reasonable way in which somebody could, you know, try to catch an exception from it? So rather than sprinkling, sprinkling it everywhere, I'd rather think about where I'm putting it and only put it where, where it actually matters. That is my idea here. Final. Final is different. There was uh, somebody, I think it was uh, Fedor, Fedor, I think. And is it reasonable to use final 
on any class that you don't intend to be used for inheritance. Maybe it's reasonable, but remember that inheritance in C++ is not always about polymorphism. You can use inheritance as a tool to do other things. For example, are you completely sure that there is no valid use case for your class as a base class? And one of the things I'm thinking of is strong type defs. Um, for example, if I have a variant of A, B, and C, sometimes deriving from that variant to give it a strong type def is beneficial in some cases. Sure, I could store the variant inside as a data member and then expose part of the interface that I want, but I have more boilerplate and I have to keep it in sync with the API of the variant myself. Same, same idea for custom types. You might have your custom type and somebody might want to use it as a strong type def while preserving most of the interface. Marking it as final would prevent that. So it kind of like inhibits reuse. And if there's no good reason to do it, why do it? Why annoy people that might actually have a use case you haven't thought of? That's the other uh, point that I'm trying to make. Um, final is one of the features we call unsafe in the book. And unsafe in this case doesn't really mean inherently bad or that it has security issues. It just means that it's really not worth using or teaching at a large scale because it can harm code reuse in a large company, which can end up costing real money if you know, it annoys enough people often enough. So my point here is like, finally, is a tool that you have in your toolbox. Don't put it everywhere just because you have it, but think about where it actually really provides a benefit. And I have an example of that, an example where final actually makes your code more correct. Imagine you have this great platform where you have a 512 bytes in bit integer as a fast built-in type. And on that cool platform, you can use a type dev to do that. On any other platform, you would need to create your own software emulation of that built-in, and the way you can do that is with a class. Now, if you wanna make your software emulation as close as possible to the actual built-in type, you should make it final, because you know you cannot derive from built-in types, so in order to make them match as, most, as much as possible, marking the software implementation final is a good idea. And this makes your code more portable because if somebody actually tries to inherit from int 5, uh, 512 as a strong type def in a platform that doesn't have it, they will be able to, but then their code will not compile if they ever try to use it on the cool platform where it's a built-in. So in this case, it makes them more uh, behave more in, in the same way, if that makes sense. It's, it's a nice extra portability sort of, um, sort of tool that you can use in this case. Some more examples about this. Uh, Constexer functions, I mentioned this before, if you overuse them, then you can get your API locked in a way that you might not have expected. Maybe you want to remove Constexer because you realize, oh, I need to do something in there which requires something um, that is not Constexer friendly. And the other issue is that the body has to be visible where the function is actually being used. So you might have more physical dependencies in terms of header inclusions, slow down compilation time, and so on. And even if you think that your function can technically be used at compile time, and even if it can, will people do so? Does it make sense to mark anything that could be constexper as constexper? Think about it. Maybe, yeah, you, it could conceptually be used at compile time, but if your function is about parsing compile time com command line arguments, then probably nobody will do that. Train return types. Uh, we've seen these at the beginning of the talk. Um, you can use them everywhere consistently. And I mean, there's really nothing wrong with that, but if you only use them where they give you a benefit, for example, where you're dealing with uh, function pointer types, or when you wanna change the name lookup rules for your return type, when you're using a decal type expression for Sphina, then whenever somebody sees a train return type, they know that there is a reason for it. It's there because it's enabling you to do something that you couldn't do with a traditional return type. So that's something that I think is valuable and it's consistent with the first precept. Const variables, um, maybe Marshall was talking about the, the, you know, the, the, the const member variable member function qualification, but also variables themselves, you can think of them as, uh, as part of this precept. You could put const everywhere, right? And probably it's a good default. It's a better default than what we have right now. But the, the truth is that if you put const everywhere, sometimes it's just not beneficial. Again, imagine you have a short function, maybe one line or two line, it takes an integer, does something with it, and returns the new version of the integer. Maybe it's correct to, to mark that parameter as a const int in the de definition of the function, but it really doesn't help anybody. On the other hand, if you had a very long function and you have a lot of moving parts, knowing which variables are const and which ones are not actually gives you a lot of information when you're reading that function and you can focus on the actual moving parts of, of the code. 
This is a bit inconsistent with the first precept, so I don't really like this. Um, I don't know how to resolve this in this mental model, but again, these are guidelines, they are not rules, they are not meant to be applicable 100% of the time, because non-const is more powerful than const, therefore you should always use const unless you don't need it, but you know, that's move semantics and stuff like that, it's not that easy. Yes? Yes, so that's a great comment. Um, short functions can sometimes uh, grow into long functions. I'm, I, I get the idea that if you, the parameter was const to begin with, you wouldn't have to worry when the function grows. On the other hand, you can also add the const as the function is growing. It requires a little bit more discipline from the point of view of the developer. And again, it's a trade-off, but it's a very good point. Thank you for making that. Override, override is probably the opposite of this. Use it liberally. Wherever you can use it, it is correct. And if it stops being correct, your code will stop compiling. So there are places in C++ where we added things that you should use all over the place. And whenever you use them, they are correct and they are the best solution. Override is an example of that. And I wish we had more of this, but I couldn't think of anything else, unfortunately. Okay, so what do you think is the second guideline given all that I've said? Any ideas on we can, uh, how we can formulate it? <laughs> Don't die on the wrong hill, I like that, but it's not what I was thinking of. Say that again? Okay, we're getting there. I decided to formulate it in this way. Value is a function of rarity. And what I mean by this is that the more often you use something, the higher the risk it is that it becomes noise and people stop paying attention to it. If you use things more sparingly, only when they are really, really required and they really provide a benefit, they are more rare. Therefore, when people see them, they are gonna think about, okay, why is this thing there? I have to think about it because there's a reason the developer put it there. That's the way I see it. And again, I have to tweak it a little bit, put the asterisk there and say most of the times, because as always, this is a guideline, it's not a rule. It doesn't apply all the time, but most of the times it's a good thing to keep in mind to uh, keep complexity at bay. Small note on consistency, because this is kind of the opposite of consistency. And I would say that consistency is something that's very valuable and important, but it's just a factor among many that changes or affects the quality of your code base. And I really like this image. I think I've used it in at least four talks, but it says consistency, it's only a virtue if you're not a screw up, right? And <laughs> It's, it's true, right? Consistency for the sake of it is harmful in my opinion. If you just do something because it's being done everywhere else and you know there's some drawbacks to doing that, but you still do it just because you want to keep consistency, then ask yourself, why are you doing it? What does consistency give you? And consistency can be easier or more convenient than simplicity. For example, Clang Tidy will happily put no discard on any function that's const qualified and that doesn't do any side effect. And as I mentioned, that is technically correct, but it devalues the places where no discard really matters. If you have a very strict style guide that tells you, hey, you have to put a space everywhere, uh, you have to put a two new lines before a comment and stuff like that, sure, it's gonna make your code consistent, but what is the actual benefit of that? What does it give you? So I think that consistency for the sake of it is not a good idea. So my stance is value correctness and simplicity over consistency, think about what you're doing and why, and then after you've solved your problem in the simplest possible way, be consistent. There's, it's, it's good to be consistent, but only if it doesn't provide drawbacks to the correctness and the simplicity of your program. Don't be dogmatic, rules are there, but I like to see rules as guidelines, especially when working with C++. You know that for every rule, there's like five exceptions. So it's good to have guidelines, but they should be that. They should be guidelines, not rules. And I said if you can afford it, because sometimes, you know, if you have a very large company and you are just hiring hundreds of new engineers that had never used C++ before, then it might be reasonable at the beginning to give them rules. And as they get more experienced, they will figure out the rationality behind the rule and potentially break it where they can understand that. So teaching that is also a bit complicated in those situations. Almost done. How do I want you to use these precepts? There they are. A uh, few scenarios. You have a brand new C++ feature and it's super cool. You're very excited, you wanna use it everywhere. 
maybe remember these things and only use it when it actually provides a benefit. And I'm guilty of that. I love C++. Every time something is released, I just want to put it everywhere. And sometimes it's not the best idea. Um, resolving conflicts during code reviews or debates. If you have a code review and people just cannot agree on whether you should have something there or that's too much, that's too little, then maybe referring to this might help people get consensus on something. Migrating a legacy project to, some, to more modern standards, usually that's also a source of contention um, because if you start adding all these features everywhere all at once, then yes, you are modernizing the code, but have you thought about what's the impact of that? Maybe more carefully using them sparingly where it's needed, it's a better way of slowly migrating to a newer standard from an old one. Damage control for new developers, you know, these might be good things to tell new people when they start using C++, just be careful with what you do and think about what you're using. Teaching, mentoring, and you know, re just reducing the surface area of decision making, that's always a good thing. In terms of shortcomings, I would say that sometimes these rules result in additional verbosity, sometimes you lose some consistency in the style of your code, and sometimes, actually most of the times, this forces you to have more mental focus. It's easier to think about, I can just use them place back everywhere. It's gonna be correct and I don't have to think about it. And it takes more effort to think about whether pushback or place back is the right thing, but I do think it's worth it in the end. It's gonna give you a code base that speaks more intent to whoever is reading it. And of course, sometimes they are subjective. This is my personal opinion. I'm here to convince you probably, but mostly to make you think about these things and get your own opinion that might differ from mine, but as long as you're thinking about it, I think I've done my job properly. The truth is always in the middle, so follow these precepts, but not blindly. Think about them as guidelines, not rules. Precepts and guidelines are tools. Use them to your own benefit, don't let them use you. That's what I would tell you. I derive these precepts from my own research and experience in all the things that I've been doing, both as part of the, you know, my daily job, uh, side projects, committee, and they help me a lot when I'm working on actual code or when I'm teaching or mentoring people. If you want to derive your own percepts and you need data, you want to know how some features can be used properly or misused, what are the pitfalls of a certain feature, what are the annoyances and things like that. The book I wrote alongside my friends and colleagues uh, tries to give you, let's say, objective data about features and then you can figure out what you want to do with that data. What is the style that you want to apply uh, after you know what the problems and the good things about every features are. So it's mostly without any opinion, sort of, you know, some of them are hidden in there, but it's mostly facts, use cases, pitfalls, and annoyances, so you can use it as a reference to figure out what can go wrong with this feature or what are the best use cases for this feature. And that's all I have for you, so thank you so much for listening to me ramble a bit. I hope you got something useful from that, and I'm very, very open to comments, criticism, stories, disagreements. Let's have a discussion about this. I think it's gonna be valuable to uh, think about these topics. Thank you. Yeah? Yeah. We have two questions online. The first one is, can you comment on the view that no accept and no discard are API guarantees? Like, when I see no accept, that means it's promising to never fail. When I see no discard, that means it's a factory query, et cetera. Okay, so first of all, I wanna say they're a little bit different. Like no discard, um, let, let's put it this other way. No accept actually affects the type of the function. So it's a bit stronger than no discard in the sense that it's gonna be part of the type system um, and that might lead to some problems if you are using function pointers and stuff like that, but it's, that's a minor difference. I think I, I agree with that, and I feel like, yes, these are guarantees you want to give in your API, but when they really matter and when they are not obvious, that's what, how I would see it. If I have a function called getName, from the name itself, the API is being obvious about giving me something, returning something. If I have a function called normalize, then the API is ambiguous enough that putting another discard there solves the ambiguity. So I don't disagree with the fact that they are part of the API and they are important, I, my, my point is that sometimes they are unnecessary. You get the same information without those things on the API. No except specifically is a bit of a harder discussion because other than being a hint and part of the declaration, it actually can affect code gen, it can affect the way the code is optimized, and I've seen cases where it actually pessimizes code gen. So using it everywhere just because something doesn't throw doesn't seem like a good idea to me, and again, we have that noise issue 
is it actually necessary to tell people that this API doesn't throw or it's obvious from the context? So that's what I would say. It's nuanced and I would love, love to have a more uh, in-depth discussion. If you're on Discord, we can chat about actual practical examples. And uh, one more? Yeah. Um, how exactly does tooling fit into this picture? Because I think, and presenters have said this at CPPCon, there's a huge value in following client ID or client format rules just so people stop arguing about things that don't matter, such as capitalization and new lines. And then when you exempt the line of code from these tooling check rules, that communicates intent explicitly, which makes those opt-outs more valuable for your precepts. So that's an interesting comment. Uh, I'm not happy with how some tools deal with these things. For example, as I mentioned, the client tidy check that adds, adds no discard literally adds it everywhere, even on functions that are very obvious. If I have a function called, again, get name, I don't really need the discard there. I know it's conceptually and technically correct, but it's just noise. I'd rather keep that noise for places where it actually makes a difference. So some tools are a bit overzealous in the usage of these features. Again, I don't want to give a terrible answer, but it depends on the check, it depends on the keyword, it depends on the code base, the level of experience of the people. I don't think I have an answer that fits the bill. I feel like if you have a tool and that tool is helping you achieve your goal um, at the risk of having this extra verbosity and maybe if people, if the team you work with are the kind of people that tend to argue on the spacing before and after a period or a comma, then maybe it's a good idea to enforce those rules even more zealously than, than what I suggest. But in other cases, maybe it's not a good idea. So again, we can discuss that in more specific details on Discord if you want. I don't think there is a right answer for any situation. It depends on the situation. Um, I don't know. Let's start from here. Okay. So uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. And I think it's a it's a great concept to have this interactivity because it gives a great value to actually coming here. <laughs> Thank you. So first of all, that, but then some, it's more or less like, like a thought. And I, I don't know how well it's possible to, to integrate this in these like, rules or guidelines. Like, I, I feel that like, doing something consistently across a code base, to some extent, also adds simplicity. right? And that can either be something like, when we already have a lot of existing for loops or when we already use a lot of unordered maps, like continuing with that or like, yeah, I, th I think that like that dimension, I don't know how well it could integrate with your, with these guidelines, but I think it's, yeah, that's something that. Yeah. So I, I think I touched on this a little bit on the slide about consistency. Let me see if I can pick it up again. But the point I'm trying to make is like, um, Maybe your definition of simplicity is different from mine. Simplicity for me is mostly when you're optimizing for code readability and to have the most expressive intent as part of the code itself. If you want it to make as easy as possible to write the code without thinking much about, you know, I should use X or Y or Z, then maybe that's another perspective, another, another dimension of simplicity. And it might make sense depending on the team you're working with and on the project you're working with. Um, in my experience, for, for us, especially at Bloomberg, in a very large-scale company, reading the code and making it as explicit as possible is more important than, you know, um, making it simpler to write, let's put it this way, so the dimension there is different. It's, it's, a good, it's a good observation, and I think there is value also in making it easier for people to deliver products, but uh, it depends on the context again, so no general answer there. The one on this side? I think private also falls under your second precept. Like, for instance, with, with VEC2, I would make X and Y public. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, with the statement. Um, in fact, like, I, I would not write VEC2 like that. I would probably have it as an aggregate, right? You get the, the drawback of the aggregate, and maybe you only initialize the X, but not the Y, and then the Y is zero, which is rare, but it could happen. Um, I'm not too, I have to think about it. I didn't think about private as one that fits into the precept, but in, I, I feel like it does, right? You should only use it when it, it gives you value. If there's no point in having a private X and Y and then exposing them with get X, get Y, and set X and set Y, right? That's what Java people do, and we're not Java people. So <laughs> making them public is correct, right? So I would say if there is a benefit in adding that encapsulation, that, that, that modifier, then do it, but not otherwise. And I think you're right, it probably fits the guideline. 
Yeah, that was a good point about the aggregate initialization and only initializing one. The point I was going to make is that every state of a VEC2 is a valid state. Yes. So you might want to hide something where you need to keep properties in sync behind private. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And on this side? Yeah, uh, I'd like to raise my voice in favor of final, uh, because uh, it actually, if you don't mark your class, base class, or potential base class as final, then it means you have to, in advance, pessimize it by adding virtual destructor to avoid the gotcha by uh, whoever is, because other, if you don't add it, then whoever is uh, inheriting from it, they are kind of liable for this gotcha. They, can, they will not be able to correctly uh, destroy uh, the derived objects by having a pointer to the base object. I, I see your point. Your point is only true when your base class is polymorphic and when whoever derives from it adds new data members and use it polymorphically. But as I mentioned in the slides, Inheritance C++ is not just about polymorphism. It's totally fine to derive from a class that doesn't have a virtual destructor and even add new data members. And if you use your derived class as a value on the stack, everything is going to be fine. There's no problem there. So it requires some knowledge of how inheritance works. It requires some knowledge on how polymorphism works. But it's not always incorrect. I can derive from vector. I can derive from variant. They don't have a virtual destructor. I can even add new data members. And I can do it correctly as long as I don't use them in a polymorph polymorphic way for the pointers. So that's my stance on it. I think you're, you are focusing on misuse of inheritance and assuming that just because you have a base class, that base class is polymorphic, which is not always true. And furthermore, I could also privately inherit from these things. I shouldn't be part of my API, right? I just say I'm probably inheriting this as an implementation detail. I just want to, for example, use the using keyboard to bring in something in the from the base class API into the drive class. But again, it's not about virtual polymorphism. It's just about avoiding co-repetition when I'm not adapting an existing class. That's it? Yeah. So if I understand your argument was like, no except, for example, is like, get name obviously it doesn't throw, so why would you put no except on it? OK, so I think I'm, I'm going to kind of t t turn it pointy end toward you now. Yeah. So I understand that get name doesn't throw. But my compiler, you see, doesn't. So now my conditional no except doesn't work. Now my code doesn't compile. Now I'm coming back to you and saying, well, the only reason for you not to put no except on it and prevent my code from compiling is because you weren't willing to commit. You reserved the right for yourself to make it throw in the future. And why would you ever make no except throw and, and not let me compile my code? OK, I'm going to throw it back to you again, and I'm going to ask you, where in a realistic use case would you d detect whether a getter is no accept, and if it isn't, you would fail compilation? Well, uh, I just have a mu much bigger function where basically I want everything to be conditional. I, I want the whole thing to be no accept. And in order for the whole thing to be no accept, everything I use inside has to be no accept. Or I have to wrap it in a try catch block. I don't want to write a try catch block. Uh, therefore, I'm saying every function I call has to be no except. It, it may be a template. Uh, you know, I don't know what exactly am I getting. I'm, so I'm slapping conditional no except on, on like all the policies that you know, like you give me this policy, and it, the, you know the policy has to be no except. So now you're plugging it in as a policy and giving me like a name policy, and you're just saying, oh, this is a simple name policy. Get name. Wait a minute. I ask for no except. I see. I'm not saying that you. You're wrong. I'm just saying that your use case is very specific. And we can talk hypotheticals, right? And it's easier to imagine, yeah, I could have the situation where I'm going to have this huge stack of calls and the policy. And in the end, I check if it's not accepted or not. The truth is, I've never seen anything like that on getters in like my whole time working with C++. And I'd love to see like a practical, real example when you do that. Because when we talk hypotheticals, sure, it sounds reasonable. It sounds technically correct. But that's the point I'm trying to make with this talk, right? Unless you actually needed that in practice, then it's just noise. So, well, I, so the only reason you know that like on move constructor it's important is because of the vector. Until layer yeah. of vector, you didn't have an example for that either. Yeah, but vector is ubiquitous. Like everybody's putting same but things in vector. But it didn't have that thing until you know, uh, like it, it didn't depend on it, and then it did. What, what do you mean by that? Well, vector move optimization like wasn't there, and then it became there, right? At some point, it wasn't reduced. I mean, it was there in eleven. 
for sure. Yeah. Okay, and so we didn't have no except before 11. So. All right, fair enough. So, okay, so in this case, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we can discuss it later. I feel like, I see your point. I just feel like, you know, if there's no actual practical use case, it's easy to think about there could be one, there could be one. I'm trying to be as future-proof as possible, but then it's just um, a mental exercise that doesn't actually give you any benefit in the real it's, world. It's a general contract. Like, you're giving a narrow contract and you're not benefiting from it. So, you know, kind of as a sort of general rule, like, you know, give a, give a wide contract if it doesn't cost you anything. There's multiple perspectives we can see this from, and I think all of them are correct in one way or the other. Um, we could talk about this forever, but I appreciate your views, and I don't think you're wrong. I just think, like, we have different priorities or different views. I would be happy to continue this conversation later. How are we doing on time? Can we have no more questions? I'm really sorry, everybody. Thank you so much for your interest and for the questions. And we can chat outside. Thank you.